Jitu, you are the first person who comes on the podcast for the third time. Wow. Thank you. And every time you have a different role. So thank you for that. There's, there's one person who's really happy about that. So it's great. Thank you for that. So the, <laughs> the first time you joined us, uh, nobody was listening. Like I think this was early days product school and you were one of the early believers. You were still the chief product officer at Box. A second time you were the EVP and GM for cybersecurity and collaboration at Cisco. And now you got recently promoted to CPO. Yeah, they, they give these jobs to anyone these days. <laughs> feel good. So maybe we can start with just learning a little bit more about how is your new role different from the previous one? How's the new role different from the previous one? So the way that we are structured right now, and we'll probably end up evolving the structure a little bit because of the change, but um, I used to run about 10 billion of the 44 billion in revenues. Um, and now... We pulled everything together. And the large reason why we did that is what, what ends up happening is, you know, Conway's law is true where you tend to ship your org chart as a large company. And so what ends up happening is organizational boundaries start showing in your products. And, um, you know, people are focused on their product and they don't integrate with anything else. And before you know it, a customer is buying Cisco, but you're selling your organizational unit. So we needed to make sure that that actually changed. So we pulled it all together. So now networking, security, collaboration, Splunk, um, observability, all of those things come together. And that actually just gives a much better holistic platform effect for the customers, which is one of the key priorities for us. And can you give me a sense of uh, size of your product org? Size of our uh, R&D org. So we are about six and a half billion of um, um, R&D budget um, of the 55 that we have on the north, on, on the top line, and about 30,000, 33,000 employees. Uh, you mentioned Splunk. Uh, so March of 2024 is when you confirmed the acquisition for 28 billion with a B. I'd uh, love to learn more about the, the rationale and how that fits into the broader picture. So, you know, in, in the way that we're, we were thinking about this, um, in order to be a world-class networking company, which is what our core is, you have to be an amazing security company because otherwise you're just selling dumb pipes. That doesn't make any sense. In order to be a world-class security company, you have to be a world-class AI company because the threat vectors and the sophistication of threat actors is, is so high now compared to, what, compared to what it used to be five years ago that you, you simply can't go out and handle security at human scale, you have to do it at machine scale, and so AI becomes a core part of your defense. And in order to be a great AI company, you have to be a great data company. And Splunk really helps us kind of further the cause on the data. For those of you that don't know Splunk, they capture a lot of log and metrics data around um, you know, different systems so you know exactly what the events are that are occurring. Um, and then correlating that data is, a, is really effective across multiple domains. So if you happen to have, um, you know, data about an email system and you have data about an endpoint system and you have data about what packets flow through a network and you have data about what's happening at the application level, correlating that will actually allow you to better detect threats and compress the time for investigation. And so uh, we felt like that was a very additive capability for us. Um, and one of the things that in large companies you have to keep in mind is not every company is worth buying because either it might be the wrong time or it might be too expensive to buy or it might just not have the right kind of synergies with the rest of the business. Whereas with Splunk, it was a great culture fit. Um, it was actually a perfect level of, um, you know, uh, adjacency that, that we needed to have. Um, uh, and our product was incomplete without Splunk to some degree. And those are always the best companies to buy where, you, where you, the, the product completes your overall portfolio and story pretty well. And I read you also committed a billion dollars for an AI-specific fund to invest in other AI companies. So I want to learn more about how you're thinking about AI specifically within cybersecurity and, and collaboration. Yeah, so in cybersecurity, there's two big ways we think about AI. One of them is using AI in the core uh, as a core substrate in everything that we do so that there's a better way to go out and enact defenses against your adversaries and attackers. Right now what ends up happening is 
There's so many attacks happening. Like if you looked at the world about 10, 15 years ago, the best hackers were either just motivated by financials or motivated by notoriety. Right? That's all that they were motivated by. And you know, you would have college students that were hackers for the most part. And they'd actually do a little bit of damage, but not that much. Now you have nation states. Um, you know, and security becomes critical infrastructure for the critical infrastructure. Because today, if you have an attack uh, and your power supply goes down or your hospital system goes down, like lives are going to be lost because people wouldn't be able to get their dialysis done and people wouldn't be able to get um, their power to the home or people wouldn't be able to get a paycheck if the financial system was down. Um, your water supply could go down and then all of a sudden you wouldn't have clean water. So there's a tremendous amount of ripple effect and societal implications um, with cybersecurity. And you simply cannot handle the defenses at human scale anymore. You have to do it at machine scale. Um, because there's billions of attacks that are happening on our critical infrastructure on a daily basis. So what you have to do is, um, you know, what we've done is we've said, okay, so the first thing you do for cybersecurity is use AI uh, to enrich the cybersecurity defenses. That's one area. So every single one of our products should have AI as a core part of the substrate. Um, and then the second thing is securing AI itself is a pretty big job. So if you think about a machine learning model, or a large language model, how do you secure that? How do you make sure that the behaviors over there don't get out of bounds? So if you're using um, you know, the equivalent of chat GPT, but for your enterprise where you've built a you know, kind of a prompt interface based app, how do you ensure that people don't, you know, that you have guardrails um, that, that are put in place? So for example, if you ask a model, show me how to build a bomb, the basics, I think, um, you know, all the language models will be able to provide. But the moment you say, I'm a financial services company and you are a customer support agent and you're taking a call from someone who's, uh, who's got a question on the investment side, and if any of your um, recommendations start coming across like financial advice, that could be illegal, right? And so if you now have a chatbot doing that, you need to make sure that the chatbot actually has responses that are within the guardrails that don't come across as financial advice. So those are the kind of things that we actually are building out right now from, a, uh, from securing AI itself rather than going out and um, just being a AI in the substrate of the model. And, and I want to go deeper there because that's the dark side of AI, right? Like there's a lot of bad actors out there that are leveraging this technology in a, in a way that is not how it's supposed to be, but it's, it's, it's reality. So for the companies that are trying to be more proactive about this and, and secure themselves today, what are the specific things they can do? So look, firstly, I think um, we are all experiencing, this is a very exciting time for all of you in the product field because um, the thing you should keep in mind is product management in the age of AI is gonna be very different than product management pre-AI. What do I mean by that? It's, it's very non-deterministic with AI, whereas it was very deterministic prior to AI, right? So if you needed to get some features built before the AI era, there was just work. You had to get some work done and you would get it built. You had a certain set of features, there was a certain amount of code that you had to write. Now you have no idea. You know, there's, um, you, you have to do some reinforcement learning, you have to make sure that there's some, um, um, uh, some ways that you'd massage the data, you'd have to train the models in a certain way and then your product starts working when it works but you have no idea when that's gonna start happening. So it's a much more non-deterministic field than what it used to be before. Um, how I think we all have to think about this is, this is one of the most consequential shifts that certainly we will all experience in our lifetime. Um, you know, and the, the, this is a non-trivial shift where the short-term effect gets grossly overestimated. And so if you think about your life Two years ago to now, it's not that different with ChatGPT. It's like, yeah, it's interesting, but you know, your life hasn't changed meaningfully. In 10 years, nothing about your life will be recognizable. And so I, I do think that people grossly overestimate the impact of these technologies in the short term, and then massively underestimate the impact in the long term. And so 
the way I think about it with uh, AI and security is, as you use AI to weaponize against humans, you have to use AI for the defenses, because otherwise you're not going to be sufficient enough in the kind of defenses you'll put up against the weaponization that happens from very, very sophisticated actors on an ongoing basis. And by the way, it's an entire industry. So if you think about ransomware, there's actually companies that do ransomware as a service. They provide that as an infrastructure where you could go out and go to them, pay a subscription, and figure out a way to go make sure that ransomware gets infiltrated into your environment. Um, and so these are like, uh, you know, what, what used to be that security was kind of a thing that you would have as an afterthought. You have to have security baked into the way in which you build product today, baked into the way in which um, companies are operating the entire environment. And there's very few things for which a CEO gets fired today. You know, one of them is, of course, like, you know, you do something stupid or sexual harassment or something of that sort. But the second thing is, you know, if you have a massive breach, that could be a company-ending event and it could be a job-ending event for any of the executives. So you have to be very, very careful of it. And so I do think that the significance of AI and how it's used in security is going to only compound over time. You have a very interesting quote I'm going to, to read here related oh to this. Don't worry, it's not too old. It said, in cybersecurity, the true enemy is the adversary and we'll work closely with our competitors to jointly beat them. Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I think that the, in most of our industries, what ends up happening is you get very competitive with who you're competing with in the market, right? Like it's, um, the, for example, in my case, in WebEx, WebEx is one of the products we have. We compete very fiercely with Zoom. Um, but when you start thinking about something like cybersecurity, yes, I compete with Palo Alto Networks, but the true enemy is not Palo Alto Networks. The true enemy is the adversary. And actually, it's going to be very important for the industry to exchange data with each other and correlate threats more effectively. Because if we don't do that, like humanity is at risk. This is not just a commercial interest. It is something that's going to have a meaningful consequential effect on society at large. And so it's, um, I think it requires a very different mindset. So your competitors have to also be your partners. And frankly, that's actually starting to happen now, even in other industries where you can't have a zero-sum game and a zero-sum approach anymore. You have to think about this as you're going to compete uh, with your largest partners and you're going to partner with your largest competitors. And that's just the way that life's going to be. And you just have to make sure that you get into that mental model because the more you think about a closed system, uh, the less strategic advantage you're going to have in the market. So you have to think about this as a product manager from an ecosystem standpoint, not just from an internal standpoint. So like if, if we were to think about like what we would do with Palo Alto, we'd love to make sure that we exchange data with Palo Alto and Zscaler and CrowdStrike and Microsoft and any of the other kind of cybersecurity players in the market. Because if we don't, and there's an adverse event that occurs, it's actually going to be bad for all of us. Yeah, and I also think from the go-to-market angle, there's, there's a play there, right? Like, as much as a company would want to sell the entire suite of products, the reality is that maybe you need to start with certain modules. So, so how do you go about allowing those type of integrations? And I'm not talking about internal integrations between your products, but like external integrations with your partners. So here's the thing that happened with SaaS that I think was beautiful. And prior to SaaS, most people had a very zero-sum approach to this thing. And I learned most of my ecosystem kind of uh, instincts at Box. And Aaron and I would talk about this all the time, who's the CEO at Box. And one of the things that is really important in SaaS is there's this beautiful thing that got created called RESTful Services, where you could call an API through a URL. And before you know it, you're able, and the expectation of the customer changed. But the customer's expectation was, hey, if I happen to have Salesforce, and if I happen to have Cisco, and I've invested in both of these, I expect you to make sure that these two technologies work well together, because there is an easy way for them to integrate, because there's a RESTful service available, right? Um, so that was the first start, which is like non-competing vendors in the ecosystem should probably go out and tie together. The second piece then is, 
I happen to have two competitors that happen to be in the same um, investment pool. I'm, I'm going out and I've purchased products from both of you. And the best example I can give you is Microsoft Teams and WebEx, right? These are, these are competitors, but we know that at some point in time, and this is a good rule for you to keep in mind, when someone exceeds 20% in market share and you don't partner with them, all you're doing is excluding yourself from their market. That's all you're doing. So economically, it makes no sense for you not to actually have a much broader way to go out and think about it. Because if you do partner with them, then you could participate. So let me give you an example. With Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Teams was getting great momentum. We build some of the world's best devices. In fact, we were the first um, device manufacturer right now, probably the only one right now that has an NVIDIA chipset built into all of our conference room devices, right? So we can move a lot of AI to the firmware level. So we, we built a lot of these devices. What we did was we said, well, let's partner with Microsoft so that Microsoft can run natively on our, on our devices. They can take over and run their operating system on our devices. And we should run WebEx on the Microsoft operating system on our devices. What did that do for us? It allowed us to make sure that anyone that had standardized on Microsoft now became an insertion point for us where we could go into that account. So commercially, it was great for us. Well, what did it do for Microsoft? Commercially, it was great for them because a lot of customers had actually invested already in Cisco devices, and they didn't want to change out their infrastructure, so they were able to do that. And the both of us, if we would have been stubborn and said, no, we don't want to partner with each other, we would have both lost an economic opportunity. In this case, both of us benefited from the fact that we partnered with each other, and we were able to have the benefit of the customer translate to benefit for us. So a lesson I would give to the product managers is, don't start by a navel gazing and looking at your own technologies first. Start from the customer and work backwards. And even if in the short term it feels like that might not be very beneficial to you in your product, if it's right for the customer and you work backwards from their requirements, you will eventually actually benefit. And so that's a very important kind of mental model that you should think about is uh, embrace and extend, even with partners and competitors, if you have to, because eventually what that does is serves the customer, and when the customer sees that you're actually doing all the things to serve them, they end up in turn serving you. You mentioned NVIDIA, and I, I stalked you on LinkedIn and many other places to, to come prepared, and, and I read that you started buying GPUs around six years ago. So that wasn't that obvious. What was the trigger for you to start investing in AI there? So I, I, I think you have to make, you have to place certain bets. And one of the big things that a product person does is knows, like one of my big lessons I learned was you have to identify the megatrends and use them as a tailwind. Don't ever fight a megatrend. Chances are you'll never win, you know? So use it as a tailwind. However, what's important is knowing the difference between a megatrend and a hype cycle. And they're two very different things. So for example, Web 2.0, complete crock of shit. Didn't make any sense, right? And when people started to go out and do that and say this is gonna go change the world, it was very hard for them to even articulate the use cases. And all it was was this scheme where the, vent, the, the VC community just kept hyping it up. But there was not really a use case that you could really kind of sink into. With AI, you didn't really have that much imagination that was required. If you just said, I'm gonna see a linear, maybe even a logarithmic or exponential growth curve for this technology, anything is eventually possible, right? And um, what we did was we started with some of these core technologies in our WebEx business uh, at Cisco before we started taking it elsewhere. So in the WebEx business, it's like, all right, so I'm in a, in a web conference, I need to take out background noise. And so we actually had a sound and acoustics module that we actually um, purchased from a company and that got embedded in our product, where you could segment background noise from human speech, amplify the speech and suppress the noise. And before you knew it, it was magical. People would have lawn mowers in the background and you couldn't hear it on the other end. And that became, that, that felt like magic, you know? And so we continue to keep doing that. And then we said, well, 
this is great for the WebEx platform, but if we want to extend our platform to other third parties, let's actually move AI into the hardware level, which means you need it to have NVIDIA chipsets at the hardware level. So you need to have GPUs that can actually go out and process the workload. And once you did that, the beauty of it was now anyone using their video conferencing tool with our hardware could benefit from our AI. So now noise removal can also work against Zoom, and it can also work against um, Google, and can also work against Microsoft. And so that became a benefit for the customer, and it was very unique because our products were superior on that front compared to anyone else. And it was very hard to go out and just incorporate that in um, instantly. You, you had a couple year advantage, and then we kept working on it and we kept getting better at it. So I think the other big lesson over here for product managers is focus on getting 1% better every single day rather than getting 3,000% 3, better in six months because 1% better every day will compound to something much, much better. But what you have to do is keep chipping away at it and have a level of grit and have a level of stamina that you don't give up because the moment you give up, someone else comes in. But in business, the people that win are not always the ones that have the best IQ, but it's the ones that have the most stamina. You know, the reason Microsoft does so well sometimes is Microsoft has very long staying power. They will stay in a, in a, in a, in a market for very long. Um, you know, a company like Cisco, I'm trying to make sure that we have very long staying power because you have to do things for multiple years to be able to really go out and change the shape of an industry. And by the way, when you do stop innovating, um, you start falling off a cliff. So we've had that happen sometimes as well, and we have to just make sure that we are maniacally focused on continuing to get better. But getting better doesn't always mean adding more features. Getting better means that you have to make sure that you're solving real problems customers have. Don't build vanity features. That might actually create more, more of a negative effect for customers than a positive effect. I want to double down on that. I, I heard you say recently that ambition is to become the world's largest startup. And I know that sounds great. And Steve Jobs said that Apple is a startup within a startup. It's funny because startups always say, we're not a startup. And large companies say, we are a startup. So how can you break that down and, and, that and really down. articulate what, what that means for you? So um, being a startup means you have to operate at speed. Being a very large startup means you have to operate at speed at scale. You can't just operate with speed. You have to operate with speed at scale. You know, and that's really important. So like, I think it requires an entirely different mental model of how you have to condition um, the body of work that needs to happen. You cannot just go out and say, I'm going to do something fast and try it out. Because I'll give you an example. If we have 17,000 salespeople, in order to get 17,000 17, salespeople trained, is an enormous activity. And if you have something that's half-assed, those people are just going to give up. They're not going to use it, you know? And so you have to make sure that you've actually got the right level of mental fortitude to say, I'm going to do something at speed, but I'm also going to think about scale. And I'm going to make sure that this thing can actually be simple enough that gets to a very broad audience so that they can actually go represent it to the market. And so simplicity becomes the core tenant in, a, in becoming the world's largest startup. You have to distill it down to the most important few things rather than trying to have, just jam it with capabilities. Because at some point in time, I think humans have reached their level of saturation on how much more sh stuff they can actually consume. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to make sure that you do it in a way that, um, that's at speed and the clock speed of your business is very fast. You can't take too long for decisions to happen. Um, and so you don't get too bogged down with the hierarchy of, um, um, of, uh, of an organization. You have to make sure that you can, go to, um, you can go deep in the organization and have a fast clock speed. But the second thing you have to do is you have to operate with scale. You have to keep in mind the importance of scale. So at speed, at scale, with the underlying um, you know, kind of substrate of um, uh, being very simple is super important. By the way, Cisco is not very good at all of these things. So we make things overly complicated sometimes. And so we have to make sure that we change the culture on that. So I'll give you one example. We use so many fucking acronyms. It's crazy. It's completely nuts. You know, and we, we come up with acronyms at runtime. They'll be like, well, you have to get 
approval from JP. I'm like, who's JP? He's like, well, that's G2 Patel. I'm like, I never go by JP. <laughs> Why are you calling me JP? So they would start doing that. And so what we have to do is we have to change the mental model of saying, let's make sure that we speak not in jargon, but we speak in English and we speak in simple language. Because the goal of communications is not to make sure that you sound smart. The goal of communications is to make sure that the receiving party gets smarter as a result of your communication to them. And oftentimes what ends up happening is people actually try to think that they need to sound impressive. And when you give acronyms and when you give jargon, it makes other people not know what it is. And I keep giving people this example. I'm like, look, if we're, if we're 85,000 people in the company and 10% of them leave every year, that's 8,500 people that leave. That means 25,000 people will be net new coming in by the third year. If you're talking in jargon, most of those people will not know what you're talking about and they'll feel too stupid to ask, so they won't ask. And a quarter of your company will not have any idea what's going on, you know, and that's a really big cost, right? And so what we've tried to do is said, don't do that and instead not reward jargon, but reward simplicity. Because what that will do is allow you to operate at speed, at scale, and so it's such an important kind of underlying value system that needs to be in place. To, to that point, you actually, I, I learned that this from you in the first interview, I, you said something along the lines of alignment is the enemy of innovation. Yeah, so this thing about alignment, what ends up happening when you get a company to go, becomes large? Why does a company become large? Because they actually had success in something, right? That's why they became large. How did they get success in something? They were, at some point in time, every company was a startup. They started, they actually had this obsession for the front line, and the founder and the CEO was the biggest sales champion. They would be go, going out and selling the most of the deals, right? And so there was not that much asymmetry between what the customer knew and what the company knew, because the CEO was always in front of the people trying to collect requirements. And so they were really good at understanding the sentiment of the front line. Now the company gets bigger. You've got layers of management, right? We all, um, all the executives now sit in some ivory tower somewhere and they've got people who've got people who've got people who've got people who talk to a customer. Before you know it, it's like the telephone game. By the time it actually comes to you, it's completely corrupted in the message. You have no idea what the actual customer had said. So what happens in large companies is large companies are very good. They become very good at the math of the business, but they're not very good at the core foundation and soul of the business, which is what is the frontline sentiment and how is that getting incorporated back into the product, right? And what large companies do a lot of times is they will say, well, I'm going to make sure that um, as a large company, I'm, I'm, I'm going to largely focus on um, the core financial elements and I'm not going to focus on the front line. And the moment that starts happening, it's the beginning of the end. And so what you have to do as a large company is fight that instinct to only listen to layers and layers and layers of management and actually go direct to the customer and rep make sure that the people, like your loyalty, my loyalty is never to my direct reports. My loyalty is to the individual contributor that's getting the work done on the ground. And if a direct report, who's a senior vice president or a vice president or someone who's got a big title, is not serving that individual contributor well, then that person is not who I should show loyalty to. I should show loyalty to the front line, right? And so alignment is where most of the time gets spent in large companies because all, what do they do? They say, you know what? We spent three days and we all aligned. And before you know it, you're spending 80% of the time aligning, 20% of the time building. It should be the other way around. Like, yes, align by all means. Like, as you get larger, you're going to have to align. But if you're spending 80% of the time aligning, you're not building anything. So my bias on this one is at some point in time when you spend more than a certain amount of your time aligning, something has gone wrong terribly in your business and you need to make sure that you take a step back and say, what do I need to do to build more so that I need less alignment because of the way in which the structure needs to be created, it needs to build more. By the way, this is exactly the reason why we got 
we changed the product organization at Cisco. Because we used to have three or four different people that were EVPs, right? And so if I needed to make a decision across different areas of the business, you get to have four people agree to it. Now, all four of us were really good friends. But even then, there are four different human beings that have to agree to something. It's much easier if you've got one directly responsible individual. So at some point in time, you have to make sure that you actually continue to keep taking stock of your companies and saying, am I spending too much time aligning or am I spending most of my time building? And if you're spending too much time aligning, somewhere along the line, the system got the better of you and you've actually lost touch with the front lines and you've become good at the math of the business, but you might not necessarily be good at the soul of the business, which is why the company succeeded in the first place. Did that make sense? Yeah. I didn't mean to ask, thank you. I think this is such a good way to, to wrap up the conversation. We might need to do a fourth round at some point. Thank you so much for your time. It's such a pleasure. Thank you all.